I think what we have here in Hollywood is high art. It's party size, If you could go anywhere in the whole world, where would you go? I always want to be part of something bigger. Yes. Let's go. So I'm actually going to start with asking you guys about something that no one's probably asked you about yet. That opening party scene, man. Opening party scene that goes on for 30 minutes? Yeah. Florals yeah. and spring yeah. groundbreaking. It's um, worth talking about. It's so gnarly and gargantuan that I, yeah. I had to start Seriously. off by asking you guys, what is one detail from shooting that sequence that you feel like you'll remember forever? <laughs> Ooh. There's so many. Uh, the, like, actual oh, orgies that were yeah. literally happening. Um, it was a lot of nudity. Yeah. There was a lot of nudity. A lot of nudity. Lot of, you had, as Jean says, you, she tells it better, but you yeah. be careful where you get backed up. Yeah. <laughs> you bend up over or sit down. Up. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it, um, it also... Yeah, I mean, we shot it for a while, and to keep the energy up every time, it was so kind of hilarious. We would all band together, and we had the most incredible group of background artists, you know, composed, you know, dancers. I think some people were actual porn yeah. stars, just extras, friends, you know, everyone kind of in there together and creating this atmosphere day after day after day, hour after hour. And it was just, we'd all kind of pump each other up like a sport team going <laughs> onto the field. It'd be like, all right, come on, come on. And then we'd go for another take. And then, yeah, it Three, was- Three, two, one, yeah. nudity. Yeah, yeah. Literally. Like that. yeah, yeah. literally. Damien Chazelle is able to cram so much in, a, in yeah. one shot. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I've never quite seen it, really. And the camera is like capturing it all, and he's just waiting for you know to, till it, that one take where everything falls into place. Mm -hmm. It's wild, pretty magical. I can't wait for the world to see it. It was my favorite scene in the movie, but another scene that I really loved, Brad, was the scene between Eleanor and Jack. Yeah, yeah. and it reminded me about the last thing you and I talked about after I talked to you after Bullet Train because we were talking about the later stage in your career. And I was watching it, and I was wondering, I wonder what further reflections Brad is having on his own career after shooting this scene. I've never thought that we were more important than the machine itself. You know, the film takes place when this new industry is, is, is blooming, and uh, it, they're, defining, they're defining itself. And making that big jump, of course, a lot of the silent artists were left behind, and they moved to more theater actors. For me, no, I, I, I've never... I've always seen us as all part of a community and not that the thing does not exist with one of us. It exists with all of us. And, and you see this lineage of all the people you've come before. And, and I see this younger generations coming up and Diego being one of them and doing fantastic work. And it's all, you just feel a part of this, this wonderful lineage of community. That's, that's the way I feel. Oh, that's beautifully said. Yeah. And I love that you just said that about Diego. Diego, you, you know, man. Diego crush it. <laughs> he did crush <laughs> it. He, I mean, he walked in, you know, and crushed. <laughs> you really did. And Manny has such an interesting entrance into Hollywood. And you did too, because I was reading that Damien had you pretend to be a production assistant on a commercial yeah, that he was shooting him. with Brad. Is that how you guys <laughs> so first met? That's, Can we yeah. hear more about that, that day? Yeah, Damien called me and he told, I was in Mexico and he told me like, I'm going to direct this commercial and Brad is the lead, but also you are going to get to know like uh, the DP, the costume designer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but the idea, like in the crew list, in the crew member of the commercial, I was Damien's assistant. And then Damien told me like, work as a PA. So the idea is like, nobody has to know that you are the actor. So I was working there, like a PA, giving Coca-Colas and bringing coffee to everyone. <laughs> and at some moment, it was Mary, Mary, uh, the costume designer. Yeah, so we were sitting in a, in a couch, and uh, Mary told you, like, Brad, have you met Diego? <laughs> yeah, He's yeah, to play. Yeah. And it was, like, a little confusing. And Demian was like, yeah, I want it to be a secret. <laughs> but is that Demian Chazelle's mind, like, metafictional sometimes, but also, like, very creative, you know? Like, this is an opportunity. Let's do it. Let's pretend you're a PA, why not? <laughs> it's a great way to meet Brad Pitt, I mean, why not? <laughs> Did that throw you for a loop? Uh, I, it was, yeah, it was a bit confusing. <laughs> wait, that, what, what? Oh, great. That's so funny. Margot, I have had, been so lucky and had the pleasure of being able to interview you in so many different roles. And I read that you said, this is probably the greatest role you'll ever play. 
And when I saw you fight that snake, I was like, she's not wrong. <laughs> what was it like choreographing that scene? And what was it like for the both of you watching her do that? <laughs> no shame. Wow. Yeah, we no were, shame whatsoever. We were all out in the desert and... Uh, the it, freezing desert. The freezing. freezing desert. I have no top on. For all the things that were carefully crafted and choreographed, this one actually kind of wasn't. And <laughs> it, it was a lot of me like flapping, like trying to fling my arm around to fling this puppet snake up so it would look like it was real and writhing in the air and then just <laughs> screaming and running after people. And it was just, it was a sh show like the way the way it looks on screen is actually a little bit how it was yeah. like I would run after Lucas and he's got the toilet seat around his name he trip I mean it was so it was so hard not to laugh but we we had a lot of fun and then of course there's you know Diego's character goes down and Brad's character goes down and just Ooh. all hell breaks loose <laughs> and then Lily's character comes in and kind of like bosses the situation but I mean it was it was insane and we had real rattlesnakes uh, that were full of venom, as Big, quote yeah. unquote, for the ra Big. snake wrangler said, huge rattlers. And it was it was just the whole thing was madness. Like our, an average day on Babylon. Not, she's not phased by snakes. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, have, they have the ten deadliest. <laughs> Yeah. Well, tourist. Yes. well thanks for sharing that that scene was just the best I love this movie so much and when I went home and reflected back on it I had such an outer body experience because I live here in LA and I was like whoa how many people have like lived in my apartment that like yeah. worked in the movie industry and huh. how many people are going to be having the conversations I'm having with you guys right now yeah. just like hundreds of years from now the sort of immortal immortalness of it was yeah. So that's why Damien's so amazing. But what I think what I took away the most was this is really a movie about people who want to make their mark in the world. And so I wanted to know what stamp do you want to leave on this big ocean we call the movie business that we're just like waves in? Well, I, you know, I would say, the, I mean, the characters you see in all in different ways are all fighting for, you know, to have meaning, to be loved and some about it, go, go about it in healthy ways. And. Some of us don't, <laughs> but um, it's just that just to be able to contribute to the, you know, to this, this, you know, I mean, I think of the stories I grew up with and how they affected me. They got me out of my hometown and out to see the world. So, you know, to be a part of that, I, you know, and hopefully some some of the stories that I've been able to be in will do the same. Yeah. What would you, where would you guys land? I think this is me leaving my mark this that's why i wanted Definitely to be a this one. part of this yeah <laughs> that's why i wanted to be a part of this movie so bad i thought this is going to be one that stands the test of time this is going to be a movie that people still watch in 10 20 30 plus years and i'll be a part of hollywood history if i'm in this movie yeah um that's how people is going to remember you yeah. <laughs> as nelly they're like she was crazy i don't know it's a dream and i like the idea of um uh, here, uh, Los Angeles, no California, Hollywood is the place where the dreams come true, right? And at least for me, it's it's happening. So I think that quote is true. <laughs> you know, when I first moved to LA, I got your face touching, you know what the signs on all the doors read? No actors or dogs allowed. I changed that. Good morning. Good job for you. I'll do anything. That's the c they said to screw us. Yeah! Jean, congratulations on this Thank movie. You. It's it's so good. One of my favorite scenes is between Eleanor and Jack. Oh. And she's talking to him about the twilight of his career. And I was watching it and I was thinking about how you and Brad are these veteran actors. And I wanted to know, did the both of you reflect on the meaning of that scene? We didn't talk a lot about it um, because it's just so gorgeously written, you know, that it was just kind of all there on, on paper. But... And, and Brad doesn't have a lot to say, but I mean, working with him and just the look in his eyes, it was just, it was like heartbreaking, you know, because it's that what she says to him is what every actor fears and doesn't want to believe is true. And it's um, kind of devastating. But then she ends up, you know, just, she's right there telling him, you're, you're going to be immortal. I mean, people who aren't even born yet are going to know who you are and think they know you. And, and that is that magic that everybody kind of is attracted to. 
that we all are. It's like everyone yeah. in this room, yeah. right? Like it's yeah. it's it, the immortal and mortalness of it. It just that really stuck with me when you're like, fifty years from now, some kid's gonna see you and it's yeah. gonna inspire. I mean, like that's so yeah. true for you too, Jean. Mm. And I just love your character, Eleanor, because <laughs> first of all, you have like the best characters with the most insane fashion sense. <laughs> yes. Just like the best. But I know that Damien also made you base your character off various writers from that era, right? Like Eleanor Glynn and Adela Rogers St. John's. I was wondering what you took from those people to sort of create your Eleanor. Well, I mean, again, I always, I don't, I, I try not to go overboard with research because I feel like if it doesn't support the script, then it's just going to be a conflict. So I always let the script sort of be my 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 roadmap. But he did he did uh, mention um, a couple of people to me specifically Eleanor uh, Eleanor Glenn, and I found her really fascinating because she she was sort of a fairly proper English woman, but at the same time she wrote very racy novels, and she came to. Hollywood because she obviously was attracted to this industry and you know she was one of the very first women to ever write a screenplay and oh. she wrote um, a, a movie that Clara Bow did and she coined the phrase it girl wow I didn't know that yeah yeah and uh, she was she was really interesting that's really fascinating thanks yeah. for sharing that I love the conviction that Eleanor has and every time I've heard you speak publicly, Jean, like whether you're accepting an award, you have this unalterable knowingness and presence within you. Oh my gosh, you. thank you. And it is so, I just had to ask you, where, where do you think that comes from? Well, that's a very nice thing to say. I, I don't know. I, I guess um, if you feel strongly about something, then it's really easy to talk about it. It's sort of like when you watch politicians and you can tell immediately, or at least you should be able to tell immediately, um, some people get fooled, um, whether or not they really believe what they're saying or they feel passionate about what they're saying. Like the way when you listen to you know, Obama speak, you know, I mean, you could yeah. tell, or, or, or Clinton too, for that matter, both super bright, and you knew that they could just speak endlessly on a topic because... They felt strongly about it and they knew a lot about it and they didn't have to stop and think or even, you know, look at notes or anything. It was just kind of, but I, I don't, I'm getting off topic, but I, um, I guess part of it too is just, you know, doing it long enough, you sort of feel more comfortable and, you know. Every time I watch you, I'm like, how can I get that? <laughs> I love it <laughs> well, so Well, you just much. have to live a little bit longer. <laughs> no. A lot longer. <laughs> <laughs> That's so funny. Is it important for you, for character, when you're picking a role, for your character to have that conviction too? Because I've noticed it when I've seen you in Watchmen or Hacks or, you know, in this. Well, no, not necessarily, because I certainly want to do things that are um, kind of very different from each other. Um, that's sort of the goal as an actor to not do the same thing, you know? So no, not necessarily, but maybe I'm attracted to, to parts like that. Um, like when I think about like, say, for instance, the character I played in Fargo, mm -hmm. you know, and people said, oh, she was scary. I thought, no, she was just a really supportive mother. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's that conviction. It's so magnetizing <laughs> and absorbing. I love it about you so much. Like oh, when, thank you. Well, I just want you to know when I watch you, it, it is so inspiring. Thank you. Um, I have to ask you about the most outrageous party scene, like known <laughs> to man, that's like literally right behind you. What is one detail from shooting that sequence that you'll just remember forever? Well, one thing that just made me laugh in retrospect, in retrospect was the party scene at Jack's house, the pool party, where there's topless women and guys are jumping in the pool in their tuxedos and everything. And Eleanor is just kind of sitting there, kind of just taking it all in. I don't think it, it actually ended up as part of the scene. I don't think we actually focused on Eleanor at all in that scene. But when we shot it, I didn't even realize until we were almost done that the whole time there were four young guys completely naked behind <laughs> me throwing a football back and forth. And I thought, talk about being upstage. <laughs> I didn't even know they were there. <laughs> when did you notice? I, well, I, 
because because the next scene is when we're all going to the desert to watch Margo fight the snake. And there was a little scene which ended up getting cut where I'm squished in the back of this car with all four of those guys. And they're like shirtless and drunk. And I'm just, you can tell Eleanor's just kind of in hog heaven. She's like, you know, have any of you read any of my books? You know? <laughs> and she's like, oh, you know, of course they're like clueless, you know, but. Wait, that's amazing. Damien, we need to release that, please. That's <laughs> literally iconic. Um, before I leave Eugene, that's, that's an image I'll never forget. I feel like this movie is really about people just wanting to leave their mark on the world. So I wanted to know, like, what stamp do you want to leave on this mm. industry in this massive ocean we call the movie industry that we're all just like waves in? Well, I've always tried to, when I was younger, I would I would think, okay, I don't want to do anything, do anything that'll embarrass my parents. Um, I know that's a silly thing for an actor to think. I got into a huge argument with a friend once who literally stopped speaking to me because I said that. He said, well, you're not a real actor if, uh, you, know, if, if you don't do, you know, nude scenes, all this kind of stuff. And I thought, okay, whatever. But um, I've always wanted it to be something that I would be proud of and not be ashamed of and that it was well written and 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 um it, it was interesting because Charlton Heston, who I would not normally quote Charlton Heston, but he said something that I thought was very wise one time. He said, as an actor, if I believe I have the power to make people feel something or think differently about something, you know, or enlighten them about something. He said, I also have to accept the fact that I can affect them negatively, not just positively. And I've always thought that was a really smart observation. And so I try to, I try to think about that. I, I don't want to do anything that's damaging. Well, if only that friend you got in a fight with knew that you were in the back of a car with four shirtless, sweaty guys. <laughs> <laughs> they could see you now, Gene. You know what we have to do? We have to redefine the form, map those dreams, and print them into history. Look up and say, Eureka! I am not alone. Let's talk about the opening party scene. <laughs> yeah. What detail from shooting that sequence do you feel like will just remain ingrained in your brain? For giant. years and years to come. Like if you had to close your eyes and just think of like the imagery. Oh gosh. Should I be a little bit more obscure? Filtered? Absolutely. No. <laughs> the amount of skin. That's um, a great way to put it. Man, yeah. man, hey. Right? And the the large volume of white powder that was pushed out on a cart. That was the first time on set where I realized, oh my gosh, this is how it was back in the day. And how did not more people die every day? <laughs> did it smell like baby powder? <laughs> I think it was lactate powder. <laughs> That's well, just a funny question. <laughs> <laughs> it smelled like baby powder. She said there was so much of it. I love that smell. Uh, it was definitely lactate like, No, it like, wasn't like baby powder. powder. It was yeah, lactate yeah. powder, right? What about you, Joba? <laughs> What's the, it's the same, it's the amount of skin. There was just so yeah. much going on and I was like, I've never been so hyper-focused on something where I, was, I had the trumpet in my hand and I was just like, close your eyes. <laughs> pretend, you're hitting, pretend you're hitting a really high note because it's it's so distracting. And also because there were so many moving parts in that scene, we really yes. couldn't afford to get distracted. So yes. everybody was doing their own thing, but mm -hmm. the camera's forever moving. moving. So if you're, you're doing that count and it's like mm -hmm. by count 15, the dude is supposed to have the champagne bottle like, you know, yeah. In his back or whatever. Yeah, because everything's a yeah. dance, you know. It, so. Wow. How long did it take you guys to shoot that scene? I think we decided it was two weeks. We forgot. It felt like two weeks. Two weeks feels right. Yeah, I think it was. Two. Which feels like a year when you're doing it like over and over again. Over and yeah. over again. Yeah. High energy. Fully committed. Yeah. Amazing background actors who are just like. Yeah. Well, let's talk about you guys though. Fully committed. That performance, Lily, was oh, yeah. so good. Thank you. It was just, you were so um, mesmerizing oh, on gosh, screen. Thank you. And I know that sometimes actors can come to their characters more through finding how they dance. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to know how did that performance help you find Lady Faye? 
Um, well, I started out as a dancer and then I kind of took uh, singing lessons um, on the side and then acting came last. So I started out in musical theater and to have been able to do this film and get to use all three things that I've you know, learned to do in my life was really rewarding. And it almost felt like a nice circle. Um, but it was it was really fulfilling because I got to do, you know, stage performing again mm -hmm. that day because I got to perform in front of all the background actors, which I had not done in a long time wow. since I was last time on stage. So you're like, I'm a triple threat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I was like so nervous nice. because like, don't fall, don't trip, you know, all these things. Yeah. Um, Jovan, I wanted to ask you, thank you for answering that. I was reading that you and Damien were texting a lot, different songs to each other mm -hmm. to help to sort of craft who Sidney Palmer is. And I was wondering if there was a song specifically that resonated with you. Yes. Lush Life by John Coltrane and Johnny Hartman. It was one of the most beautifully written and performed songs, but also one of the most like depressing. Mm -hmm. And it's not that we felt that like Sydney was always depressed or anything like that. We just talked about jazz music and which songs stayed with us the most, like after we listened to them. And that was, that's one of my favorite ones is actually the whole album is called Lush Life, but the, the single Lush Life and Damien's, I can't remember what Damien's was, but he also has a way larger jazz collection in his, uh, in his repertoire than I do. So, but yeah. Lush wow, life. I love the, the way that you describe that. I feel that way when I listen to Thelonious Monk. There's like this yeah, depressing you know sort of undertone, but yeah, it's like but you need that for jazz. You need yeah, that. it's so good. And I know that you guys use Duke Ellington and Curtis Mosby as mm -hmm. references. So what did you pull from them to sort of craft your it was, it was more just a conversation about those, about these early pioneers. And along with them, I, I shared with uh, Damien, there was a, it's on YouTube now, I think, but there was a round table uh, on Charlie Rose, I believe it was. And it was with Stanley Crouch, uh, Wynton Marsalis and Robert Greene, who are all different pioneers in jazz, but more contemporary jazz. And they had this discussion about what music meant to them and what music or jazz music specifically, how important it was to like the musical diaspora or whatever. Um, and I kind of used that conversation to take, I took like things from each of those guys as far as like how they spoke, you mm -hmm. know, their personalities and things. And I kind of took a little bit of, from everybody to kind of build Sydney. And Sydney wasn't solely based on one person, so I had a freedom to kind of take some creative license and, and just have some fun. Right, and that's what's so cool about all the characters in this film oh, is yeah. there, there's little parts of a bunch of different people. Like Lady Faye, for example, of mm -hmm. course there's Anna Mae Wong, but partially inspired. Where does where does uh, Anna Mae start and stop in your character? And then what did you bring to Lady Faye? I mean, she was presented initially as Anna Mae Wong, so a lot of research was done on her uh, when we, uh, when I was cast, Damon said, you know, this is a, a fictional character uh, based on anime, but here are some of the scenes that, uh, here are some of the scenes from films, the great classics uh, that inspired it, such as um, Marlene Dietrich in Morocco is the inspiration, obviously, for the opening number in the tuxedo. Uh, so I, I think it's just, we, we still share a very similar characteristics with a little bit of both of them. It's sort of like making a little martini uh, with a couple of ingredients. So yeah, mm -hmm. it all came together just through, again, same same thing, a little, uh, lots of chats about what we like, what felt right. We tried a different, different, a bunch of different voices and yeah. Well, you make a stellar Lady Fame martini. Great. Shaken, not Great. stirred. I loved it. Thank, Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> what I really took away from watching this movie, like when I went home, was just this notion that it's really just about people who want to make their mark on the world. And so I wanted to ask the both of you, what do you hope your stamp is on this like huge thing we call the movie industry, like hundreds of years from now? I think that's it. It's just to be spoken about hundreds of years from now. That'd be great. I mean, there's so many, like, that'd be cool. <laughs> not, to say, not to say it so casually, but there are so many gifted artists that exist right now that are probably like out on the street that will never get discovered. Mm -hmm. It's just like a weird thing of life and especially in this industry. So just to be able to make a mark and to be remembered as an artist who always tried to push himself and enjoyed what he, what he, what he does. Mm -hmm. I think that's what I would want people to think of me. Yeah, as an actor who was given the opportunity to portray someone who paved the way a century ago, mm -hmm. you know, and and being able to tell my version of the story and then um, 
paying it forward. And hopefully, you know, the younger generation will get to see it and it should inspire them to also um, pursue their dreams without any obstacles like we once had. Mm. We are going to be more than they ever bargained for. What I do means something. It's bigger than you. <laughs> I was just in New York and I love LA. So I wanted to thank you for making films about LA because there's so many about New York. And I was reading that um, you shot this in 35 millimeter anamorphic format because you said that LA is an anamorphic city and I love your perspective about LA. So I wanted to know what kind of character is LA to you? Who Who is LA? Well, LA has changed a lot for me ever since I moved here. You know, I'm still kind of figuring out who LA is. I think that's part of what's magical about it is that it is many different things and and really at its core it's just this completely unique singular almost kind of non-city city i think there's an irrationality to even the origins of la if you think of sort of building this town basically in the desert you know and how rapidly it grew beyond anyone's expectations i mean you sort of see a little bit of that in this movie la going from you know kind of rural cow town basically to major world metropolis and a lot of that have, has to do with the movies, of course, and this sort of the 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 kind of moths to the flame sort of uh, atmosphere that the movies uh, spurred on. Um, but you still feel that in LA. You feel the dreamers. You feel the people striving. You feel the moths to the flame. You feel also the desperation of that. You feel the good and the bad of it. It's it, it's a kind of crazed, again, singular place um, that has an energy that's really, again, unique, I think, in the world. And so... Uh, yeah, for me, you know, with this movie, at least, it was really a matter of trying to capture that and do that justice and, and sort of maybe see to what extent, you know, sort of where that came from. Yeah, it's interesting that you said good and bad, because when you when I think of La La Land, I think of a film that's a Hollywood fantasy. Mm -hmm. When I think of Babylon, I think of a Hollywood nightmare. And I was wondering, did you did you ever think of Babylon as a companion film to La La Land? How do you think they complement each other? I do think they are sort of two sides of, of this coin that is LA maybe. One is the dream, the other is the nightmare. Uh, I think of La La Land as this sort of, uh, you know, tender love letter uh, uh, of all my sort of most affectionate feelings about Los Angeles. And this is maybe more of a poison pen letter. But you know, at the same time, I kind of wanted to do everything in this movie. I wanted this movie to sort of encompass the full, the full meal that is LA, the good and the bad. There's a lot of love in this movie and it was a labor of love to make. And, and, and it kind of took many years for it to just sort of gestate and develop in my mind. Uh, it was the biggest undertaking I'd ever done, you know, so it sort of took me a while, a while to feel like I was ready to do it. Um, but I think part of that has to do with the fact that I wanted to try to do justice to both sides of the spectrum of LA, this sort of weird paradox, this contradiction of Hollywood, of the movies, of, yeah. of Los Angeles, that is, um, you know, on the one hand, the highest, you know, kind of, uh, of, of humanity, the sort of, you know, the, the, the most beautiful people, the most beautiful art, the kind of like, uh, uh this sort of, um, you know, humanity approximating the divine on the one hand, and then on the other hand, just the most sordid, depraved, like just kind of uh, sometimes disturbing, uh, shocking, outrageous kind of behavior that you could ever imagine. And those two things coexist, and they really coexisted in this very vivid way, kind of this kind of untamed way uh, back in the early days, back in the 20s. I think Hollywood learned how to cover a lot of that stuff up and sweep it under the rug as time went on. But back in the time of this movie, it was all still new and it was wild and you still felt the circus roots and you felt this kind of energy in the air that was completely insane. I mean, first of all, I did a writing workshop called Making Peace with Paradox. And I think that you absolutely nailed the paradox, because I think that's life, right? Is yeah. making peace with the paradox and you yeah. nailed it. Because that is what LA is. There's like high highs and there's low lows. and. Yes. You talked about it being a labor of love in the 1920s. And I know that you you did so much research. You know, you watched films from the era, went through historical archives that all ended up becoming this 100 page single space document called the dissertation. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I was wondering, out of all of that research you did. I, I didn't call it the dissertation. That's how my producer referred to it. Oh. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. We were producing. 
this is a dissertation you're giving me. We started joking about it like that because it kind of felt like that. It was like 10 years of research, just sort of single space piled into this document. I was like, okay, we got to find a story here. It's amazing. Uh, what was the craziest thing that you uncovered about the 1920s and in, in all your- It was just stuff that left my jaw on the floor. And that was what I wanted the movie to do to audiences. I had this idea in my head, as I think a lot of people do of the 1920s as this sort of, um, you know, uh, like the wildest thing people did was drink a little too much and dance the Charleston and maybe wear a bobbed haircut or something like that was the sort of that that was what was wild back then and it's just not true you know the the I didn't realize how much cocaine use there was at the time how many drugs that now of course are illegal were legal at the time how much that sort of drug adult behavior informed how they made movies how they partied how they lived um, people dying young, you know, suicides, drug overdoses, just again, these sort of extremes of behavior, people becoming movie stars like that, like overnight, literally overnight, uh, and uh, and then completely toppling over the next, you know, a year later. I mean, there was just this sort of um, turbulence to the time that I just don't think many movies have have done justice to. Yeah. And I love that you made this because anyone going in thinking like, oh my God, this is like a lot or it's excess. It's like, well, that's how it was. Exactly. And I, and I exactly. love, um, oh, I just love that you did that. Obviously no one's ever going to forget the epic opening party scene. What, <laughs> what was it like shooting that? And, or what was it like being in that chaos? And is there one specific detail that you feel like, well, you'll just never forget? It was sort of like a vortex. It felt like, you know, because we had this sort of incredible set that our uh, production designer, Florence and Martin, had sort of built. And we had the whole cast there. It was part of why I wanted to begin the movie with the parties, that it's an ensemble movie. So you have to kind of have a reason to have your whole your whole cast of characters in one space before they go their separate ways. So you've got Brad Pitt, you've got Margot, you've got Diego Calva, you've got Flea, you've got Gene Smart, you've got the whole sort of Jovan, Lee Jun Lee, you've got music blasting. So, you know, we're on set, we've got the full cast, we've got like 300 of the most, you know, I'd say the most uninhibited extras I've ever seen, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, the first few days, it was hard, it was challenging, the logistics were really complicated, you're trying to sort of get the steps right and trying to figure out how to shoot this, but by day three, day four, it started to actually feel like a party, you know, so I think by the end, we felt like we were kind of emerging from a two week bender of some kind where, you know, uh, as far as I know, no one was literally drunk or high, though, again, who knows, but we sort of felt like we were getting drunk and high on the atmosphere, on the movie. And and I think that comes across in the film. Total, 100%. Is there one detail that you, like, if you had a Oh, one detail, I mean, one uh, image sort of that remains rent free in your mind? Huh. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, um, I guess, I, I mean, it's sort of central to the scene, but, you know, I, I just can't stop thinking about this dance that Margot does that, um, you know, that she'd sort of been rehearsing for a while, kind of, you know, figuring out sort of uh, the broad strokes for it, just like in a dance studio. And, you know, we sort of would do kind of small rehearsals with her and the choreographer. But then once we actually started shooting it and she's surrounded by, again, very uninhibited extras and dancers in ridiculous costumes and like floating paper mache heads and stunts and you know, animals. I mean, the whole thing, having her in the center of that. And what's amazing about Margot is that, you know, you can create the most sort of over the top spectacle of a scene, but you put Margot Robbie in it and you still can only look at her. That's the definition of a movie star. And so it was kind of this amazing moment in the movie where her character is literally kind of becoming a star, showing people that she's a star at that moment. And, and I think there's this meta thing going on where Margot Robbie, the actress, is doing exactly the same thing, reminding us what that special something that's intangible that you can't really put into words uh, is that a star has. And you just can't take your eyes off her. It's one of the most mesmerizing stretches of sort of performance. Uh, kind of physical performance that I've ever seen an actor uh, do on film. She really is so absorbing. And I was talking to Jean Smart about, you know, the the real life people that her character was based on. And she was mm -hmm. telling me how one of them had coined, her name's escaping me, had coined the it girl phrase. Yes, Eleanor Glenn, just, yeah, the it Yeah, girl. and watching Margot, the crying scene. I mean, that was unreal. It was so well done. I was so obsessed. Um, all the characters and all the cast are amazing, but there's another character in the film I wanted to ask you about, and that is Singing in the Rain. Um, mm -hmm. I feel like that film is very much a character in yours, and I wanted to know why that was instrumental to the story that you were trying to tell. Well, you know, it's 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 the first time I ever encountered this 
period, this transition in Hollywood history from silent cinema to sound cinema was the way it's depicted in Singing in the Rain. Um, and so I think as I was making this movie, it sort of uh, bit by bit dawned on me that in some ways what we were doing was making this kind of, you know, darker, R-rated, like more extreme counterpoint to Singing in the Rain, the sort of uh, showing in some ways, uh, what I think is sort of closer to the truth of the, the, the sort of more sordid reality of what was going on uh, that you get a sliver of in Singing in the Rain, which has is, is, is always been one of my favorite films. Um, so it, it kind of felt like we could have this fun dialogue, you know, between the two movies. And, 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 and in this movie, without spoiling anything, you sort of see a little bit the literal origins for Singing in the Rain as, the, as a movie. So you kind of see, you know, it's a weird sort of indirect making of sort of origin story for Sing in the Rain um, because you're seeing the real things or let's say kind of a, a fictional version of the real things that ultimately inspired Sing in the Rain and where that song came from and where the characters came from and who they were sort of spoofing and who they were drawing from. Um, of course, again, Sing in the Rain gives you a very, um, you know, sort of uh, um, family friendly, happy ending kind of version of it. Um, Babylon, gives you something very different. Um, but uh, but I think it was important to sort of acknowledge Sing in the Rain and have that dialogue um, between the two films. I love that you added in there. And Brad in that scene is just, it's so iconic. It's so funny. <laughs> I was talking to Brad and Diego about how they met because that was a really cool way. You know, he was obviously a PA on um, a commercial you were doing. You had them meet in that way. And just everything with yeah, which was Diego's idea. <laughs> he was like, I'm I'm I just gotta get on this set. How can I be on this set? And I think, you know, because it was like, oh, I remember also because it was COVID. So it was like it was a commercial I was doing with Brad before we shot Babylon. And they would only, you know, you could only be on the you were they could, there was no visitors on set. So you can only be allowed because of sort of COVID numbers and stuff, you could only be allowed if you actually had a job on set. So Diego was like, I'll be a PA. I'll just go grab people coffee and stuff. I was like, really? You want to? Yeah. I mean, it's so funny because it's literally like the character he plays in the movie. I mean, it's the exact it's same spirit so of just good. whatever like, I have to do, whatever I have to do to get on that set, I'm doing. And that's what he did. It's the best. It's the best chemistry test. And I was also yeah. reading that Olivia walked through a lot of the lines and there's basically an iPhone version of this movie yeah. <laughs> that Diego's in, which I thought is really cool. For me personally, I wanted to ask you, um, you know, Diego was a Latinx character and as someone who's Latinx, I, th I wanted to know why you made that choice to tell a lot of the story through that lens, because that meant a lot to me. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's I think a lot of what inspired me with this movie was when I would read things that felt like I hadn't seen them before uh, in, in de depictions of old Hollywood. Um, for instance, I hadn't realized to what extent those sort of early days of Hollywood were way more uh, you know, diverse than we than we often think. And and uh, and in some ways, there was a kind of freedom and fluidity, uh, you know, culturally, ethnically, linguistically, gender wise, sexually to Hollywood in those early days that that got lost. That's one of the things I think that really did get sort of changed and suppressed and uh, uh, eliminated in many ways once Hollywood became more of a big business, a big industry and the code came in, the moral codes came in and regulations and uh, it, it just became less of that sort of free circus town. Um, so this movie is about, in some ways, you know, that sort of transition. And so it, it just felt right that you would have someone in the middle of that who, again, is not someone who you've seen before in a movie about old old Hollywood. Um, and it's also someone who would feel like both an outsider and an insider, you know, who would feel like he was at home and not at home, always at the same time, that sort of tension um, and he's got this dream, uh, Diego's character, Manny, he's got this dream, this burning dream to be part of something bigger, to be part of Hollywood. Um, but the odds are stacked against him for so many reasons. Um, but he happens to be at the right place at the right time when there's this kind of weird upheaval in the industry that allows him for a fleeting moment to, to, uh, to get a foot in the door. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's it sort of, you know, felt like that was the right perspective in some ways to hinge the whole movie on. And then through his eyes, we'd get to know the sort of the more, you know, let's say traditional movie star types of kind of Hollywood of that time, the people that sort of um, uh, maybe would be more recognizable, like the the sort of Brad Pitt equivalent or the Margot Robbie equivalent of that time. To get to discover those people through the eyes of, of a newcomer like uh, like Diego playing a newcomer like Manny felt, yeah, just felt like the right choice. 
I know that your great grandfather used to work for Paramount Pictures um, in London after World War One, and your great grandmother was a British stage actress. And your grandfather, I think his name was John, was actually also in films. So I wanted to know how making this film maybe how changed. You know all this? Wow. <laughs> I wanted to know how making this film maybe changed your your understanding of um, your own family history. Well, it's funny because I think you know, growing up, I I, I certainly didn't feel like. Uh, I had any family history in film. It was so sort of long ago. I mean, the reality is that my grandfather was, uh, as a child, was in, I think, two movies uh, when he was like six years old. And and uh, partly because, yeah, his stepdad at the time worked at a London Paramount office. They were in England. Anyway, so, and that was kind of the extent of it. So I remember sort of like, you know, I'd kind of, uh, I'd ask him questions, but I would, you know, it's sort of, oh, what was it like? I would never really maybe because he didn't remember that much but you know I, I I never felt like I got much in the way of uh of details but but it did feel like this sort of I don't know I could just tell there was so much more to that iceberg than than I was uh than than I was seeing um of course yeah it's ironic to now be you know sort of making this movie at Paramount but but it's um you know it's also one of the few studios left in a way that's still making movies like this and 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 um you know, has that sort of that kinship, that connection, that direct line to the origins of Hollywood and to the earliest days that you see depicted in this movie. Yeah, I thought that there was that was pretty cool. And I don't I don't really believe in coincidences. So uh, I, thought, I don't know. You're, you're this, whole, right. this whole film in general, you can tell is a labor of your love. You know, it's it's a love letter to movies. And I love movies. And I know you love movies. And I really think it's about people who want to put their own stamp on the world. And mm -hmm. so I wanted to know what what stamp do you want to leave onto the movie industry in this big, you know, I guess this big ocean that we call the movie industry that we're all just waves in. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, we I think that's exactly right. We are just waves in this much bigger thing. And I think um, I don't know, I, I guess that, that sort of inspires me to try to take the long view, you know, and I just I, I just want to make things that stand the test of time that sort of. Uh, feel like they're doing playing some small part in pushing the art form forward and trying to sort of um, expand the definitions of maybe what you expect from a movie you know um, so I don't know you know a lot of it's personal also it just goes back to movie experiences that I had growing up or as a sort of you know budding cinephile where I would see a movie and go oh, I want to do that you know it would just sort of inspire me to try something like that or to take that kind of a risk or that kind of a leap movies where you feel the fearlessness, you feel the, you feel the, the sort of restlessness with the limits of the form. You feel like, you know, this sort of ambition to not just make another movie, but to, to make something that, that, you know, shakes people and rattles people and shocks people and pushes things forward. Um, so I, I think that's, that's always the ambition. Um, but it is about ultimately making something that's, you know, hopefully timeless and that, you know, you can kind of come back to in 50 years, 100 years, you know, if, if we're so lucky um, and get something from.